Hello, my name is Stephanie Barnes, and this is my presentation entitled Cryptocurrency, a Bridge Across the Digital Divide. Before I begin, I kind of want to go ahead and excuse myself. Um, I've been under the weather. I probably sound very stuffed up. I sound stuffed up to my ears. Uh, my voice uh, may be a little hoarse because um, I'm still getting over that. But I'll try to do the best that I can. But I wanted to apologize beforehand. That being said, let's move along. So who am I? As I said before, my name is Stephanie Barnes. I am a recent master's graduate uh, with a degree in cybersecurity from Excelsior College. I also have a bachelor's degree from Excelsior in information technology. Um, before that, I had a psychology degree from Florida a and I've been in the InfoSec field for about four years now, working in a security operations center as a SOC analyst. <coughs> Excuse me. So of course, I want to start off with um, an agenda so that you guys can keep me honest so that I can keep myself honest. Um, we're going to talk about the digital divide. We're going to talk about Black people in cryptocurrency slash the blockchain, cybersecurity and cryptocurrency, the digital dollar, and a cycle I think as a people uh, we should avoid. So this is the Webster's definition of what the digital divide is. It includes not just educational, but social and economic inequality disparities between people who have computers, and people who do not, people who have uh, or readily have online access and those who do not. You can think that this could be a simple thing and maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't such a big thing, but now with the way that our lives are interconnected with computers, with digital media and with the internet, not having um, something like a computer at home or computers in your schools or online access that is unlimited limits your possibilities. It, is the difference between somebody saying that they've been coding for nine years and somebody saying that they've only been coding for 29 years. The kind of portfolio that you could have if you had that 20 years head start is drastically different from somebody who just started yesterday. And to not see that or not recognize that disparity, disparity does a disservice um, to us all. So a lot has been said and it's been written about the digital divide and, and it's been spoken of even in our kind of hiring practices, right? That's why people have um, diversity and inclusion personnel. Um, that's why we, we try to provide avenues for historically underrepresented communities to have access not only to computers and, on, and be online, but to also have access to the programs that will put us on equitable footing as um, others that already have that kind of access. Oh. <laughs> So breaking off of that, did you know, um, this is all coming from Forbes, uh, African-American households only hold less than 4% of the $116 trillion in wealth in the US. It's a very, very small percentage. Like I can't give you the exact amount, but knowing that it's a single digit is enough to know that it's very, very small. Excuse me. But despite this, 
despite only having 4% of this wealth, we are the largest demographic of cryptocurrency investors currently. And that 23% is set to double. But even with having only 4% of the wealth and being a large percentage of the investors, 13% of our households are unbanked. And when it means unbanked, it could be from, from historical banking practices so that they, they can't get um, a, an account um or it could be because there's not a bank in the neighborhood it could be because the bank in the neighborhood is inefficient or it can be something like there are still predatory banks and still predatory banking practices there can be that there's just a distrust of, of banks but for whatever reason, any of those multitudes of reasons and more that I haven't even spoken of, 13% of African-American households are unbanked. So this all feeds into each other because it's all about our wealth. It's all about how we spend our money, how we're saving our money. If we're able to save money, or do we have the institutions in our neighborhoods that would assist us to to save our money, to build up our communities, to put the wealth that we may have back into uh, African-American communities. So how does that feed into cryptocurrency? In my research and in my view, black and brown people have a history of making their own way when the way forward has not been equitable and is not about equality we've always been able to kind of read the room and invent our way out of the situations that we might be in, or develop a new way, right? So for our communities, it really is where there's a will, there's a way. Many, Black people in, in cryptocurrency and the blockchain and even now in NFTs see the potential that these emerging technologies have and it's appealing. And it could be because it's something new. It could be because we've seen in the past where something like Bitcoin has really skyrocketed and we've wanted a piece of that. And maybe because it's something new and it's not burdened by all of the past problems and the past inequalities, we see that it might have a more likely chance of being successful for our community, for our individual lives, um, because they're not tied to the banking institutions or to the government that we might be distrustful of. So I can see why we would have that 23, excuse me, that 23% that is investing into cryptocurrency because it doesn't have the ties and it doesn't have the historical baggage that something like um, a bank or even regular everyday investing might have. It also doesn't have the cost barrier where you can put pennies into a cryptocurrency and then with the right turn of events come out a, a thousandaire or millionaire in some cases, you couldn't do that with the access that we have to something like a, a market account or investing in stocks. It's happened, yes, but usually there's a higher barrier for entry, initial entry for those kind of accounts as opposed to cryptocurrency. But like I said, we've been there from the beginning. It's not something new that there have been Black people investing in or developing in cryptocurrency. Um, these four people are just a small pool of pioneering Black people in the cryptocurrency realm. Um, first, 
we have in the green, that's where I'm starting from, is Cleve uh, Besidor, and I might be saying her name incorrectly, and if I am, I apologize, um, but she leads the National Policy Network of Women of Color, and they advocate for diversity in cryptocurrency markets. Next, we have Vernon J. And he's the founder of Equity Coin. Next to him, we have Deidre Ramsey McIntyre, who co founded the support and advocacy group Black People and Cryptocurrency. And then last is Sean Wilkinson, the founder of Storage, S T O R J, which uses the blockchain um, to aid in cloud storage so there are black people out here that are making their own coins they are building on the blockchain there are people that have advocacy groups that are teaching others in the community about how to invest in cryptocurrency how to use the blockchain how to develop how to use these kind of emerging technologies to build up right and there are, are other black pioneers than the ones that I have on the screen. And there are continue to be more, in my opinion, because we tend to seek out emerging trends and build our own off of those trends because we've seen that they can be successful for others. Or, like I said before, it doesn't have the barrier of entry that older avenues have. But with that and with building on these emerging technologies, we also have to take into account security, um, not just for ourselves, but for the community, for anybody that's new entering in, but also because in this day and age, security goes hand in hand with everything. Um, we have to be more security minded when we build digital devices, digital technologies, because if we get too far ahead in development before we think about, is it secure? How secure can I make it? There's just a lot of backtracking that you have to do. But if you build something secure as you are building that thing, then security is always the first step. They always go hand in hand. They always are developing with each other. Excuse me. So that being said, what are some of the cybersecurity implications in cryptocurrency? And all of these boxes are a way that cryptocurrencies have been kind of targeted uh, for attack. There have been illegitimate exchanges that have popped up that will get not just people's money, but also a lot of their personal information because in many of these exchanges, especially now that there's been more of a governmental eye on it, they will ask you for personal information such as you know your name or even your social security number or something to identify you maybe a picture of your passport or a picture of your id card and that can be used to impersonate you you know in the wrong hands then there are some of these exchanges that the only way that you can get the coin or access um, any of your investments, you have to use like a third party application. And you know, as well as I know that the more kind of parties that you have to have into it, the larger the attack area, the larger the surface, right? Then because these technologies are still new, there's still a lot of confusion from the end user on what they're doing, how they should do it, is this correct? Does this sound right? Um, if I press this button, am I making a trade? If I press this button, am I buying something? Am I giving them too much information? 
am I too excited about the possibility of making more money that I'm making a misstep? And without the proper guidance there, you could be. And it could be insignificant or it could be the difference between being able to pay your rent this month. Um, and then there's, of course, fishing. It's always, there's always gonna be a target for fishing for anything that's popular, any company, really. I barely have any crypto and I receive phishing emails about crypto exchanges all the time, exchanges that I've never heard of. But there have also been cryptocurrency schemes out there such as uh, OneCoin, which turned out to be just a multi-level marketing scheme and besides just these things that I have on the screen, there have been recent attacks on things like um, NFT stores and cryptocurrency exchange. There have been cryptocurrency exchanges that have kind of lost solvency and not wanted to give people their money so that they so that they went and closed down um, to avoid shutdown and that kind of thing. And because it's so unregulated are not regulated to the extent that it probably would need to be. What's the recourse? Um, other than you being upset about it, what can, who can you really call to, to help you? <laughs> but the unregulated nature of cryptocurrency was the thing that pushed its growth. It's the thing that gets the coin shooting up there to thousands and thousands of dollars. But it's also one of its most worrying, worrying attributes. And when we have that, that's where we get the push to have a digital dollar or the central bank digital currency as they're calling it right now. and. Then this talk of it has been going on for a while, but with the current administration, they've actually put a little bit of money into researching it, into seeing how we might have a digital dollar in the United States. What would that look like? How would it work? And in their press release for it, they say that this is supposed to help the people who don't use bank. So, being as we still have our 13% that's unbanked, this is for those people. But if, excuse, <coughs> excuse me, but it also affects the people that are using cryptocurrencies and the, the people that are reliant on fintech and are banking online because it's not just a change in whether or not you can just use your digital dollar for things that are online instead of putting in your bank account. There's a lot of gray area, maybe even a lot of black area on how this would work. And that's because it's just in its researching phase, but it's something that you have to think about. How will this digital dollar work, right? How will it affect the cryptocurrency that I have now? Um, is it the only thing that they're looking at just creating this digital dollar? I know for a fact that that's not true. It's not just going to be a digital dollar. Just this morning, there was an article in Wired about how the United States and Europe are looking at ways to regulate cryptocurrencies. And that's quite possibly because of all the recent news of falling prices and again of um InfoSec concerns and breaches and, excuse me, um, where was that? excuse me, InfoSec concerns and breaches and things of that nature that had happened with these exchanges that now that there are more people that are investing and have money tied up in this, hey, we should make sure this is secure for the people or even if it's not about that and you think the worst that you're just like they just want to overregulate us to death it's still something that they're looking at right 
it's still going to change the way these things operate. And we have to be able to either change with it or fight against it. But the only way to do either one or the other is to understand what's going on and keep up to date about what's happening. So what's the difference between the cryptocurrency and the CBDC? Cryptocurrencies are decentralized, right? They're peer-to-peer -peer based and the price and worth fluctuates. Like I said, that's one of the things that drew a lot of people to it to begin with is because the fluctuation for a, a lot of people in a lot of uh, coins, it meant coming up on a windfall if you, if you cashed out at the right time with the cbdc it's government controlled there's less price fluctuation and it's one-to-one -one with the dollar however much the dollar is worth that's how much the digital dollar is going to be worth regardless you know it has pluses to it especially if you are somebody that feels that regulation makes you safer right um it's not something where you would get that windfall. It's just a translation of however much money you have. If you have $5 in digital dollars, you're gonna have $5 in real life. If you have $5 in Bitcoin, up until, I mean, even now, if you had $5 in Bitcoin, it's a significant amount of money, but it could also be $5 in less in a month, in two years, in three years. A dollar is always going to be a dollar. It's not going to be worth a dollar all the time, but it's always going to be equal at least. So although they're both digital, they're not the same. They're not interchangeable, but they both impact our community, the development of both. Um, and they both have some sort of, of power, some sort of usage for us but why should we care right if you're not if you don't have any cryptocurrency cur uh currently or if even if there's a digital dollar and it's just like oh that's just it just means that i can use it in cyberspace that's great why should you care about these things if you don't have any holdings and a digital dollar is just a a thing that might exist because it doesn't exist now. Why should you care right now? For me, it has more to do with something that could lead to a bitter cycle of us as a people being more oppressed or in a worse standing economically than to begin with. And I say this because not only are we the leading investors in cryptocurrency, are not only are we significantly unbanked, but we're also the leaders in using digital wallets. We lead in banking through our phones and using fintech applications like Cash App, your Venmos, your PayPals. We lead in those kind of things quite possibly because we're unbanked, you can hold large amounts of uh, cash in, in cash in cash app. Um, or you can do all your business transactions for your, your small business through PayPal or Square or something like that. And we've taken advantage of that, right? But with the move towards digital currency, those kinds of exchanges are interactions with these digital wallets, which you're banking through your phone or being able to just send money with an app on your phone is likely to increase because we're gonna be possibly more reliant on a digital currency. If they have a one-to-one -one ratio that you have a thousand dollars in your bank so that means you have a thousand digital dollars that you can use with a push of a button. It's ease, right? It's more likely for you to do it. You won't have to go to the bank. You don't need to have a bank in your neighborhood because it's all right here on your phone. And you always have your phone, right? We all always have our phones. 
though it's more likely to increase the use of digital services. But the problem with these services currently is that they have been rampant with complaints with the services just closing, closing down accounts and taking people's money, money and scamming. And there have been data breaches at them. They are not regulated like banks are because they're not banks. Not all of them. Some some do have uh, banks attached to them. Excuse me, because Cash App technically would have a bank attached to it now that it's bought. What is that credit? Credit Karma. Now that they bought Credit Karma and Credit Karma has a bank uh, or banking apparatus to it, Cash App would, or at least that banking apparatus, would be subject to some kind of regulations. But a lot of these don't have banks attached to them so you have your money that you've never touched physically and you're unbanked and it's just in the ether really like it exists but if this tech company decides that you've broken some arbitrary rule or going against their terms of services that nobody reads because it's such small print you've lost your money and for somebody that is economically sound it is a blip on the radar but for somebody that's historically not economically sound it's not a blip anymore and that's the kind of thing that concerns me because there is this research for doing a digital dollar. It is supposed to help the unbanked, but it can hurt them. Um, so if we are utilizing these services more often and these services aren't as regulated, they're not banks. If there is something that's negatively happening, it hurts those that are in a less equitable or, or equal position more than somebody that is not right and we want to avoid that we want to avoid getting into a cycle where we're oh, excuse me early adopters and early pioneers of this kind of technology because it makes our lives easier um and it also is helping us in a way to, to have thriving small businesses or to, to send cash to our family members. It just makes, like I said, it makes our lives easier, but because of the way that it's not regulated or because of the way it's not run by somebody that has our best interests at heart, it's a business, you know, it's not, it's not about, helping the little guy, no matter how much they say it is, right? So if it's, if, it's, if it's set up and it might hurt somebody, it's gonna hurt those who are at the bottom the most. So what do I think is needed? Um, I feel like there should be a focus on education to avoid exploitation. It's how you get away from users being confused. It's how you get away from people thinking that they could put in a dime and make 10 million, right? Um, it's not just about educating about cryptocurrencies and about investing in cryptocurrencies, but also having community kind of outreach, which some of those people that I, that I, peoples, some of those people that I talked about, um, on the pioneer page have those kind of advocacy groups and other kind of groups that educate the community on what to look in what to look at um, when you're trying to invest in cryptocurrency or oh, this is how the blockchain works or this is what an nft does and i've seen that there have been a lot of outreach especially in schools to teach 
the incoming generation about these kind of technologies. And that helps. That's how we use education so that when you get older and you can invest your own money or you see that this could be an opportunity for economic freedom that you won't be exploited because you might be able to see the signs and you won't let others be exploited because each one teach one. That's a community thing that we've had for forever, right? Um, but also there should be diversity in development and that's not waiting for somebody to say, hey, we want you to fill this space, but making our own spaces as well. It shouldn't just be an investment vehicle, but also like the maker of equity coin and i know that there was another coin that was started by a brother it was um guap coin i think like developing your own coin not in a in a scammy way in an actual way where we're we're doing the programming or uh, even if you don't go that avenue and it's more of how can we make this more secure or <laughs> excuse me what can we use the blockchain for other than coin, other than investment, like Sean Wilkinson did with storage and using it as cloud storage? How can we use this emerging technology to develop something new, to fill in a void, to make something that's going to last, right? And then if there is going to be a digital dollar, if there's going to be the government, whether it's here, whether it's in Europe, whether it's anywhere, and they're going to say we're regulating this and we're going to do this, 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 this and that to make sure that it's it's more safe for everybody to invest and use these exchanges. If that's what we're going to do, we should advocate for ourselves. Even if they're not going to regulate the coins that are already out there, which I sincerely doubt, even if they're just gonna come up with a digital dollar, you can't help the unbanked without speaking to the unbanked. This isn't a nanny state, that's not what we want. What we want is equity, we want is justice. And if you want those things and you're committed to having those things come to fruition, then those people, that are you that you're talking about that you're advocating for helping should be able to say this is what we need and we need this because xyz this is what would make it more equitable this would is what would make it more just and more fair if these things were provided you know it's not just about having a digital dollar that doesn't help the unbanked if the the transmission of that digital dollar is subject to shut down at any time it doesn't help to have a digital dollar if the applications that that are popular that they're using um can't exploit them right it turns this bridge that we we tried the pioneer that we've tried to grow that we've invested in into something that's just another way for us to be oppressed and exploited then that's not what we want right so if we're not part of the development if we're not focused on educating each other and not just looking at it as an investment vehicle but actually as an avenue where we could spin off into something else or develop something new that we're just putting ourselves in a place where we can be exploited and we've already been exploited and disenfranchised enough so for me this is some advertised further reading if you're interested in cryptocurrencies and black america in the blockchain revolution in banks and why cryptocurrencies might be appealing to disenfranchised people this is some further reason there's more books that are like these but these are the ones that i recommend personally so i'd like to thank everybody for your time again i can be found on twitter at barnes underscore sn 
I also have an Instagram blue team book club where I just talk about blue team books really all the time. Um, now to like the bank big black and cybersecurity for giving me this opportunity. It's been awesome. They're awesome. Um, and everybody that's helped me told me that I should do this, even though it's kind of nerve wracking and everything. I appreciate you guys. Are there any questions?